This is the tale of John Jeremy Colton, who lived in a village a few miles from Bolton. The house that he lived in looked out on the green, and it was the strangest the village had seen. From the moment he moved there in June 1920, the changes he made were both startling and plenty. He painted the walls a buttercup yellow, and the thatch on his roof was the hue of lime jello. His windows were red and his door a bright blue. His candy-striped shutters caused quite a to-do for the townsfolk who lived there, each man and each woman, considered his taste to be almost inhuman. Each day they would stare from their great cheerless houses, clucking and tutting at home with their spouses. For everyone wished that their neighbor would move. Surely he knows that we all disapprove. John Jeremy Colton, if he were aware, seemed not to worry or bother or care. He whistled and sang as he strolled down the street, greeting each person he happened to meet. But faces were turned, umbrellas were lowered. No one replied and everyone glowered. He'll not win me with smiles, sniffed Mrs. Hythe Potter. The man is a bounder, a rogue and a rotter. The children were warned not to go near his gate. They were led to expect a most terrible fate. But the more they were told they were not to greet him, the greater their longing to go there and meet him. One day on the green they were playing at cricket when a boy hit a ball while defending his wicket. It flew through the air like a star that was falling. The breaking of glass made a sound most appalling. The boy in an instant was starting to run when his sister said firmly, Go see what you've done. So all of them crept to John Jeremy's wall and peered through a hole but saw nothing at all. What a great shot, said a voice from behind. Did you work up a thirst with a game of that kind? John Jeremy called to the cook and the maid, and soon they returned serving blue lemonade, a carousel cake with candy cane poles, and pies shaped like slippers with licorice soles. There were sandwiches too, shaped like birds and like fishes. It was strange food indeed, though it tasted delicious. John Jeremy joked and he told them a riddle. They sang several songs while he played the fiddle. He showed them the treasures he'd found in strange lands and his tame hedgehog that danced on his hands. The house started shaking with sounds of their fun. It was birthdays and Christmas all rolled into one. They left when the cuckoo clock called out, it's four. Can we come again soon, they asked at the door. They ran home to tell of the good time they'd had, but their parents insisted the man is quite mad. The children protested, defending their friend. The parents said firmly, this friendship must end. John Jeremy thought when no children came, I said something wrong, I must be to blame. As day followed day and week followed week, the house and its owner began to look bleak. John Jeremy's house was put up for sale. The buttercup wall seemed suddenly pale. The thatch on the roof was in need of repair. It looked like a spider with too little hair. The children grew sullen. The weather turned gray. The birds stopped their singing. All joy went away. Still Mrs. Hythe Potter refused to be kind. I want the man gone, out of sight, out of mind. Then. One windy night around quarter to three, John Jeremy woke and he happened to see the column of smoke that was starting to pour from a house near the green, number 74. He pulled on his shoes, his coat and his hat. Running into the street in ten seconds flat, he tore through the night shouting, Fire! 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 as the smoke began billowing higher and higher. He shouted instructions, Bring the bell in the steeple! Soon the streets in the green began filling with people. Get your buckets and pails, he told Mr. McGrump. Form a line down the street, from the house to the pump. He broke down the door and saw the hall was alight. At the top of the stairs, standing frozen with fright, was a figure he knew to be Mrs. Hyde Potter, the same one who called him a rogue and a rotter. 
Stay where you are, John Jeremy cried. I'll climb to the roof. I'll get you outside. Someone give me an axe. Someone get me a rope. Everyone watched, but with dwindling hope. At the side of the house stood a fragile old tree. Its uppermost branches just happened to be a foot or two higher than the edge of the roof. But would the tree hold him? Of that he'd no proof. The tree started creaking. A branch fell away. Everyone gasped as they watched in dismay. With a push and a leap, he flew through the air. He's up on the roof. I see him. Look there. He ran over the tiles and through a small door and down some short steps to the uppermost floor. He hacked at a lock that had jammed from the heat. When he opened the door, someone fell at his feet. It was Mrs. Hythe Potter, her face black with dirt. Behind her, her children, and no one was hurt. The cook and the nanny, the butler, the maid, all looked like they'd never been quite so afraid. John Jeremy gave them a confident glance. Come up to the roof. It's our very last chance. So Mrs. Hythe Potter, no longer aloof, clambered up the short stairs and onto the roof. Ten men held a blanket as tight as a drum. The grump gave a signal that down they should come. The boy was the first, then the servants, the daughter. Then everyone waited for Mrs. Hythe Potter. She sat on the roof, pale and frozen with fear. I simply can't do it, she said with a tear. You must, my dear lady, John Jeremy said. Just hold on to me. There's nothing to dread. The roof was now burning, its timbers aglow. It crackled and spluttered as if to say, go. So they crept to the edge and leapt into the air and landed below with mere seconds to spare. For the house gave a groan, a gasp and a sigh. Sparks flew in the air, lighting up the night sky. Then the rafters all buckled and fell to the ground. What a horrible sight, what a terrible sound. In the half-light that followed, in the hour before day, no one noticed John Jeremy slipping away. He went home to his house and fell into bed, for he ached and felt tired from his toes to his head. In the late afternoon, he awoke with a shock. He heard music and voices and a pounding knock-knock. He dressed in a minute and opened the door, and the moment he did so, he heard a great roar. A riotous cheer for John Jeremy Colton was made by the folk in that village near Bolton. Everyone danced and the soloist sang, firecrackers and rockets went off with a bang. Then Mrs. Hythe Potter said he was the best, and what did it matter how anyone dressed? Heroes appear in the least likely places, and you can't tell who's brave by looking at faces. Just where is that village you're wanting to know? They say you can find it, and easily so. Rainbow-hued houses abound on each street, and the people who live there are the nicest you'll meet. Each house has a glory all of its own. You'll feel you belong there, though far from your home. For if you're a stranger, they'll offer you tea, and a guest for a week will stay at least three. The town has an aura like sunlight through mist and a marvelous beauty that's hard to resist. It's down in a valley, at least that's what they say. A few miles from Bolton, up Lancashire way.